All right, it's not Mikum, everyone. Um, I think everyone who's supposed to be here is here. My name is Ms. Halima, and I'm actually going to go over the O-level paper two first right now for someone who just asked that question in the chat. We're going over O-level paper two first. So all those who are going to be giving the paper for O-levels paper two in the morning, this is for you, all right? Um, Emmett, should I just begin? Or should I wait? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, do you need any help? Uh, no, I'm good otherwise. Um, do I just keep letting people in or should I just begin? It's up to you. Up to you, uh, whatever. Because you they're going to keep that. coming in, though. So. Yeah, yeah, students will keep on coming in and leaving. They are like that. All right. Okay, never mind then. Uh, all right, everyone, we're going to start off with a little bit of an introduction to. The syllabus and I'll manage the, the waiting room. Don't worry. You right? continue with the session. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So uh, I would basically want to go over the general format of the paper and the syllabus first. And then we'll go over a sample paper, which is May June paper two one. All right. So um this is for 2021. That's what I'm going to be going over in this session today. So we'll go over the entire paper. We'll go over all of the questions, answers and how you're expected to answer these questions, along with sample responses by students. And then we'll tally them with examiner responses as well, what they comment on your responses. So that's basically what we will be doing right now. Start off, just a little recap of what to expect in terms of the format of the paper, as well as the general um, syllabus guideline itself. For all those who may have any confusions in terms of the syllabus whatsoever, uh, just keep in mind that the format has not changed for your session. So you do not have to worry about that in any sense whatsoever. You will not be required to make any changes in terms of the past papers that you've been practicing so far. All right. So the general guidelines remain the same. Now, this is the syllabus as per 2023 guidelines. So you have the same paper format as it was before. You have two sections for the reading uh, paper. Section one is going to focus on reading for ideas, where you are expected to read a comprehension passage, which could range from um, IGCSE students uh, could leave right now because we are going over O levels first. All right, so that is something that's going to take us a good hour. So that's what we're going to go over first because Aploka, um, I believe it's paper one as well tomorrow. So we can't do both of them together. We'll be doing O levels first. All right. So um, getting back to the syllabus, we basically have to keep in mind that you will be given a comprehension passage, which will um, range from a report, an article, an email, letter, or an advertisement. And you're expected to read through the given text and go over the questions that follow. Now, in terms of section one, the first thing that you need to understand is when they are expecting you to answer the questions and read the passage in terms of ideas, this is basically your summary question. So the overall section has two major chunks. The first one is where you're expected to create a, a you could say, list of content points that you take out from the passage itself, which is your first part of the section. And in that, you're expected to highlight content points that you take out from the passage itself. Um, and then the second part of this section is where you're expected to write a summary. Now, um, we will go over all the guidelines that are expected of the students when they're writing these responses when we do the paper. So just keep in mind that section one is the summary section where part one is writing down your notes, which is your content points. And part two is where you're expected to write your actual summary. Now, in both cases, you are tested for content points. So that is the main thing that you need to keep in mind, that when you read your passage, your content points are your main priority. And then how you manipulate those in terms of your vocabulary, that's what comes next, all right? Which is your summary itself. And then the second section is reading for meaning, where you are expected to 
understand the meaning of the passage in terms of explicit meanings and implicit meanings. Uh, the paper we do, again, we will go over different types of questions. What are explicit meanings and implicit meanings? I'll give you examples of each and we'll go over how you attempt each of the questions. You are given proper elaborate instructions as to how you're expected to answer the paper. So keep in mind that that's something that you always read through first. All right, so when we read through the paper, we're gonna go over the entire um, format. We're gonna go over all of the questions and go over the responses that you're expected to add in for your um, paper response itself, all right? So I would actually want to move on to the paper itself. All right, so this in front of you is the May, June 2021 paper for double one, two, three, all right, which is the reading paper, comprehension passages, which you are expected to read, A for meaning and for ideas, all right? So uh, you will actually be given the paper in two parts. So you have your reading section, which is going to be your insert, and then you're gonna have a question paper, all right? So if you look at this, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is the insert itself. This is where your comprehension passages are. This is what you have to read and answer the questions using. All right, so this is your resource. The first thing that you need to keep in mind is that you have a specific set of instructions that you need to follow. So you have paper two, you have one hour, 45 minutes to answer this. All right, so that's your time limit. You have one hour, 45 minutes. You have to make sure that your insert has this instruction which says that you may annotate this insert and use the blank spaces for planning. Now, this is my first tip to you students that you are allowed to write on the question paper. It's not um, something that is frowned upon. Now, please understand when I say you're allowed to write on the question paper, what I mean is that you're allowed to make your notes in terms of understanding the content itself, but that doesn't mean you write your answers on the question paper or the insert, all right? The insert is just for your reading, for your understanding, and at the same time, so that you can um, highlight any, yes, highlighting the content. You are allowed to highlight the content. So for all those asking, this is a very big misconception that students have that they're not allowed to highlight. That is not true. It says so on the question paper that you are allowed to annotate. You are allowed to highlight. You can underline, you can note down any um, ideas that you think would be important. For example, if you look at a point and you think that this is something that I could use as a content point later on, highlight it. You can even number your content points while you read. So that is one suggestion that I would have. Please do that. It saves a lot of time when you're actually writing down your notes. All right. So keep in mind that you do that. And also understand that when you are Highlighting your points, that doesn't mean this counts as your response. This is not your response. No, I'm, I don't mean you take a highlighter with you. I mean, you can underline. That's what I mean by highlighting. You're not allowed to take a highlighter. You basically just underline or, you know, make those points prominent, which you think you would be using later on. Um, if this is confusing, don't worry. When we go over the paper, we're going to do this. I'm going to solve a paper with you right now. Okay. So that's one thing that you need to take away from this, that you are expected or you should encourage to um, highlight in terms of the content points itself. So for example, this is the first passage. It is called Nutmeg. And the idea here is that when you are reading through the passage, you will obviously come across ideas that you think are important. For example, you looked at the topic itself and you saw how the title of the passage itself is nutmeg. So anything about nutmeg itself is something that might be important. Isn't that the case? So the first thing, if you read the first line, the earliest known use of the spice known as nutmeg was 3,500 years ago. So the earliest no known use looks like something important. You can highlight it when you're reading it. Another suggestion that I could give you in respect of saving time and going through the content very carefully would be to read through the questions first before you read the passage. 
So in case if you do that, what's going to happen is you will actually have the liberty of knowing that the question actually expects you to highlight two things. Um, the first question asks you to highlight the origin and the spread of nutmeg in former times. And the second one is the uses of nutmeg in modern times. So if you already know that these are the content points you're looking for, while you read, you can highlight them. All right. So we're going to go over the passage. We're going to highlight all of the important points that we think. You can highlight with a pencil or a pen. That's up to you. Because this doesn't count. This is not your response. This is your planning stage. So you can highlight with a pencil. You can highlight with a pen. That's all fine. Okay. So we basically have to highlight anything that we read through the passage, which we think might be important in talking about our content points, which were number one, the use of nutmeg in earlier times and its spread. Number two, the use of nutmeg in modern times. So that's the two content points that they're looking for. So while you read, you highlight anything that you see as important within the passage. So you look at the passage, the earliest known use of the spice uh, was in Palau Ai, one of the Banda Islands in Indonesia. Um, when you are highlighting your points, do not need to go over them in complete statements. You can highlight keywords. Keywords are very important. It's something that will actually help you write your um, notes. Your notes are not something that are expected to be in complete coherent paragraphs. They are supposed to be in points. Okay, so if someone just asked me about 12 points in the passage. Uh, good question, actually. You will uh, actually come across this passage as something that has more than 12. The passage that we're reading right now, it has a total of 17 content points, which are divided between two questions. All right. So one thing that we have to keep in mind is that you highlight all the content points and you will notice that they will be equally divided within the two parts of your note making process. All right. So the first part where it talks about the origins and the spread of nutmeg in former times. So this is something that would have about um, five extra content points other than the one they've already given you. And then for the second one, you would again have a number of content points that you're expected to highlight. You actually write as many as the space allows. Okay, so for example, the first question says origins and spread of nutmeg. Uh, let's highlight the content points together. Let's see how many there are. Okay, so every question has a varied amount. There's no set amount, 12 hai, the 12 hi honge. That's not the point. It could go up to 15 or even more. In this case, there are 17 content points. So they will be divided into both the sections. And you have to keep in mind that some sections might have more content points as compared to the others. So if they're talking about uh, the uses of um, nutmeg in modern times, that has more content points if you look at the passage altogether. All right. So we're going to go over the entire passage right now, and we're going to mark down all of the content points. And you can see exactly what I mean by an uneven amount of content points. All right. So the first content point that we have is the earliest use was on the Palau Eye, which is one of the banned islands in Indonesia. That was our first point. Um, if you go through the passage, you will see that before that, during the Middle Ages, Arab traders discovered uh, nutmeg there and sold it to the Venetians. That could be your second content point. Um, the third content point would be Portuguese sailors found the source of nutmeg when they were recruiting sailors from Malacca. And then your fourth content point would be buying and selling their ships with previous guarded in Europe. So this is how it spread to Europe as well. This is how you keep going. All right. So we keep going and we keep highlighting all the content points. Um, someone just talked about um, the content points and how they're supposed to actually be written. Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, you are actually supposed to write the content points briefly and as is. You are not expected to write the content points in your notes, in your own words. I would actually suggest that you don't do that. Do not write your content points for the notes in your own words. Because if you do that, you'll actually end up using vocabulary, which you may use for your actual summary. 
So keep in mind that your content points do not have to be written in your own words. They have to be summarized, but at the same time, pick from the passage. And um, okay, someone just asked about a question, but I'm not sure what you mean by that. All right, so um, there's a question um, about opinions and advice. I'm about to get to it. Just let me wrap up this uh, first section where you have to highlight your content points. So overall, this uh, passage itself has 17 content points. I'm not gonna go through all of them. This is May, June, 2021. You can go through the marking scheme, which will give you all of the content points. And I can uh, share the solved version as well later, but so now I want to answer the questions first because these are very good questions that you're coming up with. All right. Okay, so once you've highlighted your content points, you've gone over the passage in terms of the general content points. You look at the question paper, which is giving you two questions. A, you're expected to highlight the origins and spread of nutmeg. So there are a total of six content points. One is already given to you. So that means you have to highlight five more, okay? And then um, if you look at the second part, that is the uses of nutmeg in modern times, they've already given you one. So you have to highlight your um, following content points. One thing that I would actually like to point out over here is that when you are highlighting uses, for example, there are going to be parts within the passage where you're given examples. Examples don't count as a content point, all right? Um, one such example that I can give you is if you look at this line over here, that it has many uses in cooking of sweet dishes and desserts in countries such as Malaysia and Brunei. This is a content point. A pinch of nutmeg added to rice pudding is delicious. This is not a content point. This is not something that you would include as part of your content points because this is not a fact about the use of nutmeg. It's an opinion. To answer a question, someone just uh, prompted that, what are opinions and advices? So if they're asking you highlight an opinion about nutmeg, later on they will ask you in this paper. So this is what you write over there. One opinion that they have highlighted in passage four is the fact that is the point that a pinch of nutmeg added to rice pudding is delicious. It's not a known fact. It's an opinion by the author himself. All right. So I hope that clarifies your concern. If you write additional points that um, you think are important, you can, because there won't be any um, such thing as ex extra content points. They expect you to highlight all of them. So that is not a concern. You highlight all of the content points, you write all of them down in your notes. All right? Uh, no, you do not write uh, two points in one line. However, you can merge points that are similar to a compound sentence. So you can do that, all right? Yes, you're expected to use all of them in um, your summary, all right? So if you have included something in your notes, you're expected to include that in your summary. All right. Okay, so if you include points within the summary that are not in your content points for your notes, that actually implies that you do not read the passage properly. So that's the thing. You need to read the content points very, very carefully when you're going over the uh, notes. Read the passage, highlight. You know what? I think we should just highlight them together because you have a lot of questions in terms of content points. Okay. All right, so the next one is going it's to be... Fine. Uh, yes, it's always better to write the content points in the form of bullet points because it will save you time. And it is actually, it's called a note for a reason. You're not expected to write the whole um, passage itself as part of your notes. You are, you are supposed to write them in bullet points, number one. Number two, no examples are not included as part of your content points. Okay, so let's go over the remaining content points then. All right, so demand for nutmeg spread because it became a prized spice in European societies. Um, now, an example of how examples will not be included. It was seen as a symbol of wealth being used to, in elaborate cuisine. Now, this is an example 
of how it was seen as something luxurious. So you don't talk about this in your content points. So you have one hour, 45 minutes. I would say you divide the first 45 minutes for the summary section. It should not take you more than about um, 15 to 20 minutes to highlight the content points. And once you have the content points, read through the content points and coherently write them in your own words in the form of a paragraph. All right. One leverage that you have in terms of your summary is the fact that you do not have to stick to one word limit and you have a range. So you have a range from 150 to 180. So you can stay anywhere in between that. Yes, don't exceed it. But at the same time, you have that range. So as long as you're in there, um, that's good enough. Uh, but you, you can easily uh, differentiate between content points and examples, because if you read the content point, anything that is a follow-up information about that counts as an example. All right. Uh, for example, if it's talking about how it's spread became a prized spice in European societies, that is a content point. It was seen as a symbol of wealth. That is an example. All right. Then if we talk about um, the next move for nutmeg was when the Dutch ships arrived to the islands. So this is again talking about the next content point about how they actually spread through the continents. All right, um, local people, you can also talk about how the development of the East India Company is something that can be included as a content point. Then you can talk about how nutmeg was convenient for trade as it was very small and easily transported. So these are your seven content points in total for the first part of your question. So when the question asks you about the origins and spread of nutmeg, these are seven content points. So if you write even five out of these, other than the one they've already given, you're good to go. Okay, so in this case, um, this content point about the Dutch ships and then how the Dutch East India Company was constructed as a means of spreading nutmeg, this is a point that can be combined. So that's how you know that you can have six to seven content points for this. All right. So these are the first seven content points for the first part of your notes. Then you have the second part of your question, which says the uses of nutmeg in modern times. All right. So let's highlight those content points as well. Okay. So the first one is going to be. where we talk about how it is used in cooking of savory dishes and crosses many cultural boundaries. That's your first one. The second one is going to be about how it has many uses in cooking of sweet dishes. Now, again, for whoever is still confused about examples, a pinch of nutmeg added in rice pudding is delicious. This point is not a content point, it is an example, okay? Then we move on to our next content point, which is going to be in the fifth paragraph. Um, also this one, nutmeg finds its way, not only in food, but in many drinks as well. They've given you an example, but you don't need to include that in your content points. You can just talk about how it's used in savory foods, sweet foods and drinks. So that's three content points so far. Then you have the next paragraph where they talk about how the seed covering is used for mace. Um, which has a more delicate flavor. Now, this is an opinion. So this does not need to be included in your content points. This is an opinion that does not need to be included in your content points. And then we move on to the next. Um, just keep skimming through and whatever point you think is important, you add that as your content point. We can talk about how it is used as an essential oil. Um, it also finds its way. Uh, now, this is a content example of how you can sum up two ideas into one. 
Now this line over here, essential nutmeg oil, sometimes preferred in cooking because it leaves no particles in the food. This can be one content point. You don't need to write the whole thing as the content point. If you summarize this, uh, if you just uh, join them both together and write this as one content point, that's perfectly fine. Okay, let me just uh, let the people in. Okay. All right, so that would be your, we are at our 11th, no, we're on our 13th content point. So this is our 13th content point so far. Um, paragraph six, it has a role in the industrial Morning work. Morning in progress. All right, so that would be our next content point. Um, it can be used as an industrial lubricant. So that is your... 14th content point, then um, a paste made with nutmeg and honey. All right, so this can be our 15th content point. Our 16th content point would be it is used in some toothpastes to prevent bad breath. Then we have how many people see medicinal uses as well right here. All right, so we are exactly at 17 content points so far. All right, so these are your 17. Okay, uh, someone just said that they do section B first. Uh, that's fine. You can do whichever section you're comfortable with first because you are doing the paper on the question paper. It's not like you're doing it on answer sheets. So as long as you make sure that you spend time as um, best suited for you, that's fine. There's no hard and fast rule that you have to do one section first, but it's always preferred to go in an order to make sure that you don't miss out on any questions, okay? So these were our 17 content points as per the questions itself. Once you have highlighted all of these content points, you are expected to write a summary in which you are to use between 150 to 180 words. That's the first thing you need to keep in mind. That includes the 10 words that have been given below. So they've already given you a beginning. They've already told you how to start. Uh, no, you're not allowed to have extra sheets. This is uh, something that students tend to think that they would be allowed to get, and so they would just waste space with cutting and um, overwriting. So I would suggest don't do that. So keep in mind, no extra sheets. So you have to answer within the paper. All right? So no extra sheets. Please keep that in mind. You have been given lines and they give you lines keeping an average um, word count per line in mind. So just keep in mind that you're not getting any extra sheets. You can. So uh, someone is saying that the lines are so small that 17 points may not fit. If you look at the question, they, that's why they've divided the 17 content points. So they've given you enough lines for five points for the first question. And then in the next one, you have you have about nine lines. Okay, so over here, as long as you fit in all of the content points that are possible, you can shorten them up. That You don't have to write the complete statement from the passage. You can write the main idea. You can write the keywords. Okay. Uh, but you just understand that when I say 17 content points, I mean as a whole. Two of those content points have already been given to you. So you're left with 15 and you do have 15 lines over here. Okay, please look at the question. Please look at the question very, very carefully. That's literally the uh, major mistake that students make. They don't look at the question. All right. So when you start your notes, you have to keep in mind that you read through the question, you divide the content points as per the instructions. Once you've written your notes, you are to move on with the summary itself. Um, this is where you use your own words, okay? So this is where you're, they're testing your vocabulary on how coherent your response is and what kind of vocabulary you use. So your vocabulary has to be straightforward, but at the same time, try to use a combination of simple sentences, compound sentences, and complex sentences. If all of your sentences are very simple, short phrases, it will not have a very coherent impact on the examiner. Okay, so regardless of uh, whether or not you've written all the content points, the way you write them is important as well. 
all right? Because the content points are there in the notes as well. So what is the summary testing? This is testing the way you coherently rewrite or paraphrase the content points in order to fit the question they've asked you. So they want to summarize the origins and spread of nutmeg in former times and the uses of nutmeg in modern times as outlined in the passage, okay? So keep in mind that you are expected to write a coherent response for this, okay? So the major chunk of the summary section highlights the idea of A, figuring out whether you can identify the content points. Secondly, they want to see if you can use coherent um, terms, proper vocabulary, proper sentence structure, um, a combination of sentence structures in order to write your response. All right, one more important thing that we need to keep in mind is um, the use of transition words. So if anyone doesn't know what transition words are, you have to keep in mind that although there is no hard and fast rule, that there has to be this set amount of transition words, please make sure that you do use them. So a lot of teachers might have told you that um, you have to use at least four to five. No, you don't have to have two paragraphs. It's going to be one paragraph. So it's going to be one paragraph, one coherent paragraph that highlights the content points. And the second thing you need to keep in mind is your use of vocabulary. Number three, keep in mind the word limit. So do not exceed the word limit. 180 means 180. And last but not the least, very important use of transition words. Words like moreover, such as um, meanwhile, furthermore. These are words that you can use in order to transition between ideas. All right. So for example, if you're starting your um, summary by talking about the origin, and then you could talk about moreover, the spread of nutmeg through the continents was like this. So you give that detail. And then uh, furthermore, you can talk about how it's used in modern, modern times. Okay. So keep in mind that you use at least uh, five to six transition words. There's no hard and fast rule as to how many. Um, as many as your summary allows would be something to keep in mind. So transition words are important. That is actually what adds to the overall vocabulary of your summary itself. All right, so before I move on to the next section of the passage, is there anything that you boys want me to go, you kids want me to go over in terms of the summary section itself alone? All right, so I think the summary itself is sorted. Now we move on to the short questions that follow, okay? So once you're done writing your content points, once you're done writing your um, summary itself, you still have a three mark section, a question two. This is where you actually have to answer questions based on what you read in terms of the ideas. Now this is where they will either ask you about advices given within the passage, or opinions shared within the passage. Now, this is where you have to keep in mind that anything other than actual facts is an opinion, okay? So if you look at the first question where they talked about uh, the first part, paragraph four, they're asking you to give one opinion for each of these paragraphs. So for paragraph four, five, and six, you're expected to write down opinions that the author shares. So if you look at paragraph four, let's go back to the insert. All right, so in paragraph four, when we were reading through the content points, we already highlighted that the first opinion that they share within the paragraph is where they talk about how a pinch of nutmeg added to rice pudding is delicious. This is an opinion. Okay, um, then the next question asks us for an opinion that is shared within paragraph five. So in paragraph five, mace is preferable to nutmeg as it imparts a saffron-like hue. So this preference does not mean that it's a hard and fast rule and it's a fact. This is an opinion. The author believes that this is a reason why people use mace. All right. The best summary is when you use your own words. The content points in notes do not require your own words. 
So that's a question that someone just pointed out. All right. And then in the sixth paragraph, again, you have another opinion over here where they talk about how um, for this part right here, this is an opinion where they talk about how a paste can actually be used for a clear and beautiful complexion. Now, this is an opinion that this person is using. Okay. So the fact is that it helps remove toxins from the body and the way that it is used, the way they've structured the statement, this could be counted as an opinion. You may come across multiple opinions in certain paragraphs. That's very um, uncommon, but it can happen. So if that does happen, all you have to do is pick one and you can write it down. Okay. So usually they make it very obvious in terms of what the opinion itself is. Okay. So any questions in terms of the first section so far? No, they don't, they don't uh, have negative marking in the summary section. Okay, so basically you need to understand um, that's, you're right, in paragraph five, it is a, because it imparts a saffron like you, that is the opinion in paragraph five. So in paragraph four, a pinch of nutmeg added to rice pudding is delicious, that's opinion one. Um, opinion two is mace, mace is preferable to nutmeg as it imparts a saffron like hue. This is the second opinion. The third opinion is going to be how it is something, a paste of nutmeg is used for a clear and beautiful complexion. Now, again, that is an opinion. It's not something that everyone does. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's not a fact. It's an opinion by the author. All right. So um, going back to the question paper. All right, so you have three paragraphs where they want to highlight opinions. So it's going to be one statement each, okay? So that's it for the summary section. And that is 25 marks for section one. All right, so um, just a quick recap for those who just joined in. Um, you have content points that vary. Your content points will be divided between two sections of the passage. So keep in mind that you highlight the content points under the correct heading. All right. Okay, so you have to keep in mind that you divide the content points equally. Um, I'm gonna come back to the questions once we're done with the second section as well. Okay, so if there's anything left, um, I can just go over it again. Okay, so you divide the content points between the two ideas, then you start off your own summary. Um, one important instruction about the content points is that you are not expected to use your own words. So for a lot of you who think that the content points need to be in your own words, that's not true. At this stage, you do not need to use your own words. The question says so outright. So please keep in mind that you can use the words as is from the passage, make sure you use con the keywords, the key ideas, and make sure that you write this in bullet points and phrases, because you do not have all the space in the world. You have to fit it all in, in the given space. So you have to make sure that the content points fit in the given space provided, okay? Um, once you're done with the content points, you move on to writing the actual summary itself, where you use your own words. You are expected to remain within 150 to 180 words. You can um, use synonyms for words given. However, keywords are something that you have to keep in mind when you write your summary. The 10 words that are already given are included in the word limit. So technically you're left with 170 words, okay? So this is not going to be in note form. This is where the paragraphing begins. Pure content point so with line make SMS fit kare. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, Hussain, I believe you asked a question. Miss, pure content point ko ek line me kaise fit kare? Agar wo if the number. content point is uh, longer than you think the line will be able to take, you can cut it down. Now, that's why I showed you this point right here. Um, if you look at this content point, uh, the one essential nutmeg oil, so-called because it contains the essence of the plant's fragrance, is sometimes referred in cooking because it leaves no particles of food. So you can summarize this. So you can, since this is in terms of notes, you can actually jot them together. You can 
use phrases instead of actual coherent sentences. So as long as the keywords are there, that's fine. Um, so if you're talking about essential nutmeg oil, that's a content point in its own. Okay, so um, let's just quickly go over. Ms. Have you done advice, opinion, facts, and warnings? Uh, yes, we have, but I'm just going to go over that again since we're at that section right now. Yes. So this, if we write points more than 12, is it important to include all the points in summary? Um, yes, it's preferred because if you do not do that, then you are likely to miss out on ideas itself. So your summary might not turn out to be very coherent if you miss out on content points. So um, the best thing to do here is that if you think that um, the content points are more than you can write as separate ideas, you can actually jot them down together. So if you think two content points are an extension of one another, you can write them in one statement. Okay, so this is the idea of a summary. To summarize ideas in as few words as possible. So you're trying to make it a concise understanding of the content itself. So the content points are something that you have to summarize, all of them. But if you think that writing them separately as separate ideas is something that may not work, you may join two together if you think that they are similar. Okay, so you can write two in one statement. Miss content points ko join kis All right, so when you're talking about joining content points, um, the idea of how, um, okay, let me show you an example. This should answer your question. Okay, so if you look at paragraph four, where they talk about how nutmeg continues to be a commodity in the modern times, we don't need to add this since this is not part of our content points. But in our summary, we have to talk about two things. The first use of nutmeg is that it's used in cooking of savory dishes in many cultures. The second content point is how it's used for cooking sweet dishes and desserts in countries like Malaysia and Brunei. So if I combine these two, talking about how um, a prominent use of nutmeg is in cooking of savory dishes as well as sweet dish dishes and desserts. Have I not joined two content points? Ma'am, if we have to, uh, if we have written some points, but uh, uh, I'm sorry, if we have not written any point regard uh, from the passage, but we have, we need to add it to the summary because it is relevant. Is it okay? Okay, so if you haven't added it to the content points, that means it's not relevant. That's why the first thing that you need to do is read the passage very, very carefully and I highlight missed. content points, keeping in mind that this is all the stuff that you have to include in your summary. Mr. Yes, two right. main is points. Negative, uh, sorry? Is there negative marking for writing more points and if they're wrong? Like, um, I have written, for example, eight. No, so no, will it's I not like wrong? they're going to cut your marks, but they will only reward you for the ones that are correct. That's what I'm saying. They're not going to take away marks. That's not how O-levels works. They don't take, they only mark you for the ones that are correct. But if in an answer we include the not allowed response and the correct answer, so will it be right or they'll detect the marks? Um, okay, so Moise, if you are not including the important points and you're wasting your word limit in terms of unnecessary information, you won't be able to fit it all in together. Do you understand that? So I mean, in the content points, there are certain when. Uh, I include the answer as well as sometimes the not allowed responses they have written certain phrases. So will we mark we mark for it or they'll detect the marks? Uh, they will only mark you for the ones that are part of the acceptable response. Uh, Miss, can we Warning go a little above the word limit? Like we can write 160 or 140. Okay, so the question explicitly mentions that you have a word limit of 150 to 180. However, uh, 10 words have already been given to you. That means that you have 170 words to use at your disposal. Miss warnings ka bata de. Uh, sorry, what about what? Warnings. Uh, what warnings? Uh, points not to include? Okay, so basically um, that being said, A, the content points have to be coherent. You cannot write unnecessary points. And if you end up doing that in the notes, make sure you read through your notes before you actually write your summary so that you don't end up actually uh, writing 
those points in your summary. Yes. Uh, Miss, if one of our points is like really long, so can we utilize two lines to write that? Because okay, like, so this I... is where the idea of a summary comes in. If you think you cannot summarize it any further, fine. You can use two lines for it. But uh, no, no, just... no, Miss, I'm asking in the content points. Oh, if in the um, con no, it's I would really... suggest that summarize it. Read it in the passage first and write it in the least amount of space as possible. So it's is, the keywords that they're looking for. Is sequence in points are important? Um, not necessarily, but it's a it's a good idea to go about it in sequence. Uh, uh, because when you can, uh, you have to sequence them. Miss, is it strictly one seventy words? Ah, uh, yes, you cannot exceed the word limit. Uh, ma'am, um, what is can we or can we whole content point uh, um, as it is the summary or do we have to like is it, should the content point that we have written in the notes be in our own words as compared to summary uh the summary is your own words but the summary so we cannot, cannot be content we cannot, no no copy we cannot in the summary. pick the note and then put in summary not as it is you have to rephrase it you have to write okay. it in your own words that's literally um, the whole point get the next one get, for the words all right students i want this back and forth questioning but can you please raise your hands so that I can answer one at a time? Because these are good questions. They're helping everyone. Just raise your hands. Um, okay, Fareed, what's your question? Uh, Ma'am, if we have the words in our content, can we put an arrow or we have two words on the top of the words? So that, is, that counts as overwriting. Um, it's not encouraged, but if you end up having to do that and you don't have a choice, be very neat about it. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, Alina, you have a question? Alina Arthur, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. If I write, uh, if there are a total of 15 points and I write like about two or three points in one sentence, then okay. technically my summary is going to have 10 sentences. So is that okay? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, they're not actually, just because it says 17 content points doesn't mean it has to have 17 sentences. So if you can actually fit in all those 17 points very coherently in 10 sentences, that's actually a job well done. So the idea here is not to compromise on the content, but at the same time, if you can summarize it using good vocabulary, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Um, Fareed, do you have a question? All right, Subhan. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question that, uh, for example, if we cannot fit, uh, put all the content points, uh, fit all the content points in the summary in the given word limit, can you exceed uh, 10 to 20 words or something? Okay, so 20 words would be too much. Okay, I would never say that you're encouraged to exceed the word limit. Um, if by 10 you do end up doing it, but the content points are good enough, then you might get away with it. But I would suggest don't keep yes, that for example uh, i have put uh, i have put 12 to 15 content points but there are 17 or 18 as you said so for putting two to three points extra uh, i do not need to basically uh, increase my word limit i need to fit in that is it right yes, yes. okay that's where the that's where they make you uh, actually write the notes um arish is that a question i didn't catch that um, miss, I wanted to ask that if I'm writing the content points and I have more than like, you know, more than six for each. So am I going to add all of them in the summary because it might lead to me, you know, exceeding the word limit. Okay, so that's where the planning stage comes in. The reason why we need you to stay within the word limit, but at the same time, try to write all the content points is to actually see what content points can be clubbed together. Okay, so I would suggest that when you are done writing your content points, read through the content points, look at the ones that you can club together, number one. Secondly, um, talk about them in a way that this is where the idea of complex sentences comes in. You join in two, three ideas. So instead of writing three complete statements, you club them up into one that would be a one long compound statement. And so you cover two content points, but at the same time, you do not waste word limit. Okay, uh, Shayan, do you have a question? I guess not. Mustafa? 
Yes, I have three questions. Okay, go ahead. First of all, what is the maximum word we can write in a summary? Uh, maximum, uh, like it says on my screen, 140 to 180 words. 10 words are already included. So that's 170 of your own words. Okay, so are you going to do the passage number two, the comprehension? Uh, yes, we're going to go over passage two right after. And this. if you don't mind, can you please write the summary for us? Uh, right now? Yeah. All right, so I, I, that's why I've actually gone over the content points. I will be sharing a response with you later after this. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, okay, so do we have, Arush, do you have a question? Uh, miss, uh, I wanted to ask that we will include the two points that are given already in the above the content points space yes, in summary or not? Yes, you will. Um, okay. The summary does not have to be divided into multiple paragraphs. Uh, Mustafa, your hand is still raised. Do you still have a question? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so um, someone is saying, how do we know if we exceeded the word limit? This is where you need to keep in mind how um, many words on average do you fit into one line? So that's based on your handwriting. So some people can fit in 10 words in one line if you have very... Um, except that handwriting, you might actually end up filling in more lines. So that's up to you. Um, Arish, do you have a question? Uh, miss, are we uh, supposed to write the word count after a summary? Um, Alina, you have another question? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask that two or three content points in one sentence means three marks. Yeah. Okay. But as long as you don't compromise on the keywords so you know you don't have to just cram them up they can only be like you can club them together if they're talking about the same thing for example the example of um, how nutmeg is used in cooking and i gave you the and i used savory and sweet as two content points clubbed together okay because if i'm talking about cooking i can talk about these two things but then so when i talk about as, um, one content point right no no this doesn't count as one content point this okay. is two content points um, all right. Uh, Farhan, do you have a question? Uh, Shayan, do you have another question? You say we don't know any synonym of a specific word. Can we paraphrase the, uh, the sentence or the content point in the summary? Yes, you can, of course. Um, you don't have to know, uh, if you don't know synonyms for all keywords, that's fine. All you have to do is keep in mind that you um, paraphrase it in your own words. You do not copy paste. That's what you're avoiding. So you're writing Thank it in your you. own words. Keywords can be repeated, but that's it. Okay. Excuse me, Miss. Have you uh, covered the meaning and effect part? Uh, no, we haven't reached the second part of the section. How much have we done right now? We are literally on the first passage, section one. So we just talked about yeah. content points and we talked about the summary itself. Um, we did talk about the opinion-based question where you're expected to highlight opinions that are taken from the passage. So paragraph four, five, and six, you look at the passage and you highlight whatever you think is an opinion by the author instead of a fact itself. This is a 2021, May, June, paper two one. Yes, it should be related to the specific paragraph. So when they say opinion from paragraph four, this is the opinion, the one in blue. A pinch of nutmeg added in rice pudding is delicious. This is an opinion. Then in paragraph five, when we talk about how maize is preferable, nutmeg as it imparts a saffron like hue, that's another opinion. And then if I talk about how in paragraph six, they talk about um, using, or whoever that is, please mute, please mute yourself. Um, using a nutmeg as a paste for a fair complexion. Again, that is. Um, Arush, do you have a question? Uh, miss, is there a probability that the question of warning or advice is going to come? Have we covered that? We could, yes. So they always have these three questions at the end of the passage itself. So they will, they will have this question. 
Ah uh, yes. Do we have to write a Do we have to write a proper ending to the summary, or we just have to end it with the last point we have written? Um, this is actually where your transition words come in. So when you're transitioning to your conclusion, you could say that to conclude and then write your last word. Okay. So our opinions and advices are same. Um, yes, you know, not exactly the same opinions are opinions. That is my opinion of doing something. My advice that you do something would be different. Now that's the tone of the passage that you have to keep in mind. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Miss, one more thing. If we are adding in our judgment that we are supporting one particular thing, like it's, if it's from present times, because they often give summaries for two different things, the past times and present times. So can we write one more point for present um, or the idea we are supporting or we have to balance both the points? That That's uh, completely in terms of the question. So the instructions will be very explicit if they want you to draw a comparison or not. Okay, so if you look at the question here, they've already talked about how it's not something that they're comparing. They're not comparing the um, past of nutmeg as compared to modern times. They're not doing that. This is not a comparison. This is just highlighting facts, right? So they have written the question in that way. So if the question highlights how something has evolved over the years, and so you need to highlight that, then you'll definitely talk about the changes. Similarly, if they're talking about how something is improved, you will say that modern day is better than the past. Um, Ali Imran, do you have a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. It's more of a request. Could you please uh, shift this Q&A session to the end so we can just go through the paper first? Okay, we're actually done with this now. So yeah. we're about to go over the second bit. All right, so this is where we move on. So we've gone through the thing once, so I think that should um, make a difference. Now you have your second section, which is reading for the moment. Now in this case, the first thing that I need to talk to you about is the kind of questions that you will come across, okay? So the questions are not straightforward. They are going to have different, um, you could say, ideas that they're testing you for. Okay, so when they say that they're testing you for meaning, there are two types of meaning that they're testing you for. Number one, explicit meanings. And secondly, implicit meanings. Explicit meanings are the literal ideas that the passage itself has. It could be something that you have to quote from the text. It could be in terms of vocabulary, trying to see what the words mean. Or it could be something that you have to just write in your own words. Um, I have two kids who have their hands raised. Uh, we'll have to wait till the end. Now, I just want to go over this once and then we can go over some more questions, okay? So if you look at the second section of reading for meaning, basically you have to highlight the idea that the author is trying to convey, but either you have to do this literally, so the literal meaning that the author meant by writing the particular statement, or you quote from the text, or you choose a word that highlights this idea, or you write something in your own words, they give you a phrase and now you have to paraphrase it. So these are explicit meanings. Whereas in explicit meanings are questions that are inferential. You're expected to assume things. Something is written in the passage and you have to assume something as a counter <coughs> to that idea. Okay, so for this one, I'm gonna go side by side with the questions and the passage itself, okay? All right, so that's the insert. This is the second passage, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in to the question and then I'm gonna go over the passage and where we can find this answer itself. Okay, so the question says, for example, uh, the first one from paragraph one. So they, one thing that is good about this section is that they already tell you what part of the passage they're testing you on. So you can read the questions for passage one, go back to passage one, look at that. Come back to the question, read that, go back to passage two. That's one way you could go about this. So if you look at passage uh, two, paragraph one, the question says, how can we tell that the summer 
was likely to be a particularly hot one, number one. Secondly, they're asking you the husband's arrangement was long standing. Give the phrase used later in the paragraph, which conveys an opposite idea. So you have to basically understand what the author is talking about and given the detail from the passage that highlights this idea. All right. So going back to the passage, the first question asked us to talk about how we know that the summer is going to be a particularly hot one. So if you look at the statement right here, So in this one, you will notice that the entire statement is not necessary. If you just write the fact that every plant uh, was showing early signs of wilting in the heat. So this is something that basically highlights the idea that it's going to be a hot summer. Okay. And that is all you're expected to add in here. So you just basically pick out that idea and write it within the answer. Uh, you can write it in your own words as well, as long as you portray the complete meaning. So it's not that you have to copy paste. You can write it in your own words. Uh, B says the husband's arrangements were long standing. So you have to give a phrase from within the passage. Uh, use later in the paragraph, which conveys the opposite meaning. So the husband's arrangement was basically a long standing one. So when it says that had a long standing arrangement to work overseas. So that means something that has been decided a long time ago. Okay, so if this is something that has been decided a long time ago, then you pick out anything from paragraph one that implies that this is something very um, instantaneous, very in the moment. You basically have this statement right here out of the blue. So doesn't this mean the opposite of something that is happening and decided from a long time. He had an arrangement which was set from a long time ago. However, this is something that happened out of the blue. So you just quote this little phrase and you're good to go. Out of the blue, that's your answer for the second bit. The next question. Basically is from paragraph two. A says, why did the writer phone Renee for help? All right. So you pick out your response based on the idea that it soon became clear that the fungal infection was spreading widely through the olive tree. So this is something I phoned Renee. So if this information follows, why did the person call the person? Because there was a fungal infection. So you write that in your own words, hit the go. Um, basically, this is how you go about questions that highlight the idea of understanding meaning of the passage. All right. The trick that we need to keep in mind is for the questions that imply implicit meanings. That's where most of the students end up having confusions. All right. So I'm going to go over those first. If there are any uh, questions that you have for this particular statement, we can, this particular section, uh, the beginning section, we can go over that. All right. Uh, someone just pointed out that it should be. Um, that it had to be treated as soon as possible. The reason why this person called Renee in the first place was because of the fungal infection that was spreading widely through the olive tree. So that's the first idea that you have to highlight. All right. Okay, so if you look at the question paper, next section is asking you uh, why did Renee uh, phone for help because of the infection now this one part um, 4b1 and 2 this is very important because this is where you are expected to take out an implied meaning which approach to teaching uh, treating the trees did Renee recommend so you can look over here that they talked about them being treated with chemicals all right which approach did the writer prefer now this is something that is not outright mentioned but is something that you have to infer from the passage. They talk about how they were running the farm organically. So this implies that chemicals were not supposed to be used. 
So in this case is something that you have to actually take out an implied meaning where you highlight an organic alternative is something that the author would have preferred, okay? That's an example of an implicit question. Then we look at paragraph three, question 5a. Infected trees could jeopardize our status as olive farmers. Explain in your own words. Now, this is another example of an implicit, uh, explicit question where you simply have to highlight the statement in your own words. So you pick out the keywords. The first keyword is jeopardize. The second keyword is status. And you have to simply paraphrase these two words. So when you're talking about um, jeopardizing their status, you can write anything in between talking about how this could threaten, this could spoil, this could tarnish, put at stake, this could compromise their reputation, their livelihood, their image, any word as an alternate to these two words and you have an answer. All right, so this is basically paraphrasing. Okay, so keeping that in mind, that's that. And then you look at question um, 5b. Rene had an edge to his voice. What emotion do you think he was feeling? Now, this is an inferential question. Uh, when they say, do you think, this is your opinion. So when they talk about having an edge in his voice, what do you think this could possibly imply? So basically, they talk about how he was frustrated. He was annoyed by the kind of response that this person was giving him, right? Miss, so that's, uh, I have a question. Sorry to cut you off. Okay, Momina, go ahead. Uh, miss, uh, miss, what if you don't know any synonym for the keyword in the question that we just discussed? Like, for example, we can't think of a synonym for jeopardize. So, so do you, do you know what the word jeopardize means? That's my question to you, Momina. Do you know what the word jeopardize means? And if you do not know what the word itself means, all you have to do is look at the context. In what context are they talking about this? If they are trying to talk about how um, this is something that is not invoking a positive feeling, right? Um, for this, if it's a good question that you've brought up, sometimes you may come across a word that you don't know the meaning of or may not know a particular synonym for. In that case, I would just say in your own words, try to highlight what you think the author is trying to say. Simplify it. Uh, miss, can, it we lift the, can we lift the sentences from the passage directly to the answer? In marking you, scheme, they sometimes write directly uh, those words that are written. You can, but that's the thing. If the question says write in your own words, then you can't do that. So they are very clear with their instructions. If they want you to pick up, they won't say write in your own words. But right here it says explain in your own words. So if they do that, that means you have to keep in mind that it has to be in your own words. But if the question doesn't specify own words, then you can write that as is. So you can pick out those phrases. Uh, let me give you an example. If you look at this question right here, they said, give a the phrase used later in the paragraph, which conveys the opposite, an opposite idea of long standing. So what did we do? We picked out out of the blue and as is, we answered for this question. Does that clarify your concern? All right. So yes, you're allowed. You can pick out words as is from the passage, but you need to keep in mind that it has to be in terms of the question itself. If the question says in your own words, then there's no getting away from that. You have to write it in your own words. Okay. Just the way it does in question five a. Then we look at question five b had an edge to his voice. For this, you need to look at the content in terms of how the idea is trying to portray the emotion of the speaker himself. So if you look at this word right here, this is in paragraph three, where it says, Rene had an edge to his voice. So, in your opinion, what emotion do you think this is trying to convey? And that's what you have to highlight within your answer. So it says that I had rarely heard before and reluctantly agreed. So this shows that the response is not a positive one. So you can range your response from anything through frustration, annoyance, irritation, any word that you can highlight to explain the edge in that tone itself. All right. 
Then we move on to the next question. Uh, Renee's advice to the writer is trust my expertise. Give the sentence earlier in the paragraph, which shows he knows what he's talking about. Another example of picking out information as is and placing it into your answer. So again, you can write as is from the passage itself. So if we talk about um, how within this passage, they say that any farmer will back me up on this. So this implies that he's saying, trust my expertise. So trusting my expertise, any farmer will back me up on this. These are two ideas that can be used interchangeably. So that's how you would mention it over there. Then we move on to question number six. Now, in this case, we are moving towards implied meanings. So we start off with very explicit questions. Now we're on implicit questions. Question 6a, why do you think it is understandable that Koshia had been there? He would have done most of the work. So what part of passage paragraph 4 implies that this person requires more help, right? So if you look at the literal first line of this paragraph, uh, it says this was reasonable. He was 76 years old. So doesn't this show us that this person could require help? So why is it understandable that a 60, uh, sorry, a 66 year old, 76 year old individual would require help? So over here, this is something that you have to imply. You can talk about how um, if a person, if this individual is 76 years old, one on point one could be to talk about how he's too old to um, carry out the task himself, or this other individual must have been stronger. So if one implied meaning is this person is weak, the second implied meaning is the second person is stronger. So that is literally how you have to take out points in terms of inferential questions. Part B. Apart from the fact that Koshia wasn't there to help, why did the writer offer to be Renee's assistant? So other than the fact that this person, the husband, wasn't there, why was Renee offered assistance in the first place? So you can look at the paragraph where it says that Renee suggested bringing someone with him, one of his friends, who would accept a reasonable daily rate, but nobody strong enough was available. So this is as is something that you can talk about in your answer. You'll just talk about how none of Renee's friends were available and that's why external help was required. Okay. So again, keep in mind the question is just for one mark. So one small phrase, one sentence that says that Renee's, none of Renee's friends were available or no one strong enough was available to help them. You can write it in your own words. So you can just say that none of Renee's friends were Hello, available to help them. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, ma'am, I have a question here. Yeah? I'm from East London. Okay. UK. Yeah, my question is like, uh, how do you define nigger? Like, what's a nigger? Do you support the niggers, the Hitlers? Um, since that's nothing uh, closely related to this, you have to use politically correct terms. No, I mean, uh, it's a nigger. Like, how can you like not uh, say it's the word of English, it's Hitler? All right, I believe that that is not necessary. All right, 6C. When the writer suggested she could be Renee's assistant, he muttered, All right, so um, here you have to write your own words again. So this is where you have to use your own words to actually highlight the idea of what incomprehensible misgivings means. Um, so someone asked me earlier, what if you don't know a synonym for the word? then simply highlight what you think the author is trying to say. All right. So in this case, um, this is from paragraph four. So it's right here where um, his immediate response was a guff. Was a guffo, and then to cover this rather impolite reaction, he muttered incomprehensible misgivings, which I feared were no more than the fact that I was a woman. So, in this case, the author already highlights the idea that the person is someone um, whose opinion is not being taken very seriously, but at the same time, Renee doesn't have a choice. So, your answer would just highlight how whatever he said was number one. Um, 
mumbled out or it was undistinguishable, something that could not be understood clearly. So even if you don't know these complex words like indistinguishable, you can talk about how he was unsure or uncertain of what Rene had said. All right. So if you do not know a synonym that goes against a word, simply highlight it in your own words in terms of what you think the author is trying to say. Then we move on to paragraph five. Why did they have to take uh, the hose pipe on foot? Again, a very implicit question. which is right here, as there were no um, accessible driving routes up the olive groves. So you simply highlight the idea that there was no actual route that they could take in order to get to the olive groves. Question number six, uh, so paragraph six, question eight, why do you think Rene stood no taller than a matchstick? So this is right here. Now, this is an inferential question. They're talking about how this person is standing amongst uh, the olive grove, the olive trees, and they're saying that was not taller than a matchstick in front of them. So you simply have to imply that this is referring to how um, Rene was very short as compared to the trees that surrounded Rene. Okay, so that's literally straightforward. Um, one suggestion that I would have for this section, look at the keywords of the question. Secondly, look at the marks. So unnecessary information is just a waste of your time. So look at the question, look at the marks and answer according to that. Don't fill in the lines just because they're there. Your idea is to add in the keyword that the question is asking you. So unnecessary words are not appreciated. All right. Now, question number nine, this is uh, from paragraph two to five. And this is where a lot of students have the greatest uh, concern with, because this is a very important section in terms of vocabulary because this is where context plays a huge role, all right? So when you are talking about questions and their, the word in terms of their meanings, you have to keep in mind that this has to be in terms of the context. So you have to keep the context in mind in order to go over the meaning of the word itself, all right? So um, you will notice that the words given to you are very similar in meaning. So if you look at the word naive, um, where it talks about wrong, innocent, surprising, and silly, um, yes, the word wrong and surprising may not be something that you would use for naive, but innocent and silly are words that you might actually use in place of naive. So this is where you look at the context and see, can I use this word in place of the word already given? So if you think that the word innocent can be used in place of naive, then you use it there, that's your answer. Otherwise, you go with the next option. So if you look at line nine, my naive approach to farming, and the options are innocent and silly. So in this case, obviously we're talking about someone who is trying to imply that they have a certain set of expertise. So the word silly might not be the best synonym to use here, which is why we're going to go with our second option, which is innocent. Similarly, the next question is the word solemnly in line 11. He shook his head solemnly and told me that there was another problem. So the options you have is slowly, gently, seriously, and energetically. Now, because they're talking about a problem, it's not obviously going to be in terms of a, an energetic response or a very uh, laid back response so that we would say slowly. So we have to go with the word seriously because they're talking about a problem. The word seriously is best used here. Uh, yes, Alina, do you have a question? Um, yes, ma'am. Can you um, share the most common mistakes with this question? With this question? Um, okay, so what I have come across in terms of these questions is that students do not um, look at the passage itself when they're doing this. And you will be surprised by how many times students actually end up doing that. You have to replace the word in the passage itself and see, does this fit here? All right, because if I talk about the word solemnly and I look at this line right here, he shook his head solemnly. I can replace it with the word slowly, gently, seriously, and energetically. And in terms of uh, the grammatical structure, it would all make sense. 
But over here, we we're testing meaning. We have to keep in mind, is the author's meaning left intact or not? So if I say so, the word slowly or gently or energetically, am I trying to imply that there is a problem? And that's why he's shaking his head. Because if you look at the whole statement, he shook his head solemnly yeah. and told me that there was another problem. So if an individual is talking about a problem and shaking his head, then would I be doing it energetically or would I be doing, doing it slowly or gently? Uh, so ma'am, if we don't know the meaning of the word, is it okay to assume the meaning by looking yes. at the context? So in, yes, you look at the context and you look at what you think could probably be the best um, alternative because you will notice that if the word itself is a difficult word, the meanings are not that complicated. Mm -hmm. So then you see which of these words actually fits the context. Okay. Uh, let's look at the next question. It says reiterated in line 24. That's the next question. So Renee reiterated that he could not accomplish the job alone. So if this is a word, for example, you don't know the meaning of, I don't know what reiterated means. My options are complained, regretted, exclaimed, or repeated. It says that Renee reiterated that he could not accomplish the job alone. And so I suggested I could be his assistant. So they're talking about something that is a problem. And to a solution to that problem, this person says that I can be your assistant. So in this case, if he says that, is he complaining? Is he regretting that I cannot do this alone? Is he explaining to the person? Or is he repeating this fact? And that's why he's saying, and I, I call you because I need an assistant. This is where the context of the whole passage comes in. You already know that Renee is the kind of person who's alone on the olive grove right now. And there's a problem that needs to be sorted. This person is 76 years old. And so isn't it obvious that this person cannot do this on his own? And keeping all of that in mind, we can imply that the best possible meaning would be that this is a problem being repeat, repeated, that yes, I'm an alone, a 76 year old individual who cannot do this alone. And that is what prompted the other person to suggest that I could be your assistant. Similarly, if you look at the next line, um, sorry, the less, next question, part D, which says hint in 28. He asked Islam, with a Islam, hint Islam, of Islam. sarcasm. Uh, Walik Islam, do you have a question, Saman? Yes, ma'am. I want to ask the question that, uh, for example, a situation in which we know the uh, literal meaning of the word, but in the context of the phrase or in the passage, the other other two words mm -hmm. are used in which we have the confusion. So which one we will choose uh, for You will better... choose the one that fits in terms of the context. Even because... even it negates the literal meaning, like uh yes. Okay. So okay. it has to be in terms of the context. That is your priority right now. Okay. You cannot jeopardize what the author is trying to say simply because you want okay, if you remember looking at a dictionary. You will always come across multiple meanings, and sometimes those meanings will be contradicting one another. Yes, and you choose the one that fits the context. Yes, right. You, you cannot choose the word that doesn't fit the context because otherwise you're actually changing the meaning of what the author has written. So you cannot change the meaning. You have to stick to the word that is in reference to the context. So, for example, if you look at part D, where it says hint in line 28, and that's what you have to uh, find a synonym for. He asked with a hint of sarcasm. The options are suggestion, laugh, question, and look. Now, in this case, none of these other words have a similar meaning, and we have to go with suggestion. So they suggested, the expression suggested that this person had a bit of sarcasm in his tone. And then you look at E, which says restricted. Now, this is a word that could have multiple meanings. Uh, this is in 933. which says that um, ensuring it didn't curl and make the flow of the chemical solution restricted. Now, in this case, you can talk, you can understand that they're talking about the physical uh, movement of the chemical that should not be hindered, should not be paused, right? The options are controlled, reduced, forbidden, and removed. Now, something that is restricted can also be something that is forbidden. But in this case, would I use the word forbidden? It doesn't fit the context. So that's not what I'm going to choose. Forbidden can be a synonym for restricted, but I'm not going to use it here. I'm going to use reduced instead 
because that is what fits the context. All right. So I hope that answers your question, Subhan. This one was a good example. So restricted can also be interchangeable with forbidden, but we're not going to use that. We're going to use reduced because that's what fits the context. Uh, yes, Selena, do you have a question? Yes, um, this uh, question is like not related to this part, but I wanted to ask that I get really, really confused with the questions which start with like, what do you think this, this happens? Like they're asking for our opinion or like, um, are we supposed to pick the like um the context from the passage and then explain uh, it has to be with... your opinion in terms of the information given within the passage so it's they're not asking for your personal opinion um they're actually asking for your understanding in your opinion what do you think this means so usually when they're asking you what you think they're actually trying to imply what you think in reference to the um information given within the passage so for example um here Rene had an edge to his voice what emotion do you think he was feeling so the word someone who has an edge to his voice in general that word that word itself could mean that that person has a lot of confidence the word edge could be used like that as well but that's not what my answer is going to be because I'm talking about someone who is in a very difficult situation, the term edge is trying to imply frustration or annoyance. And that's what I'm going to think. Because if you start saying that he had an edge to his voice because um, he was someone who was considered very popular. So that is incorrect. That thinking is incorrect because it doesn't fit the context of the passage itself. Does that answer your question, Lena? So we have to look at the passage to yes. figure out in which context you're talking about? Yes, that is exactly what you're so they are Thank testing you. what you understand in terms of meaning. So everything Thank that you write has to be in terms of the context itself. Okay. okay. Every student will have a different word that they would use to explain this. If I say frustration, someone else says irritation and another one says annoyance. No one is wrong because we're all implying that this person dislikes the situation that they're in. And so is speaking either sarcastically or in a negative manner, right? So all of these answers are fine. Everyone will think of a different word to talk about it. And that's perfectly fine as long as it fits the context. All right. So even if you come across marking schemes where they have multiple um, options and they have a lot of options when they give you a, a response, they give you as many as possible. And sometimes you might actually think of a sixth one. They've given you five, you'll think of the sixth one. And that's fine as long as it fits the context. Okay. So we are on the last part of this, which is where you reread paragraph one and two, which contains expressions telling us about A, the arrival of summer, and B, the olive trees. Now, these are the main ideas that they're talking about. And what you have to do is you have to talk about the meaning and effect. Now, this is a very tricky um, question because this is something where a lot of people end up making mistakes because they fail to understand the difference between meaning and the effect. When they talk about meaning, they're talking about how it is used. What does it mean? But effect is the, the implicit meaning. What impact does the author try to create using this word? So, for example, um, in line one, it says, at a galloping <laughs> All right, so if it says at a galloping pace, the statement itself within the passage in the first line says, summer was approaching at a galloping pace. So looking at this particular statement, we know that they're talking about <coughs> something that is All right, so it's basically something that is talking about um, the summer actually moving towards you, right? Um, if you know the meaning of the word galloping, this is a word that's usually used for horses, right? So this could imply something that's coming uh, towards you with a lot of speed. And so your response for meaning would be that they're talking about how summer was approaching very quickly, right? That is the meaning. That's the answer for part one, meaning, that summer was approaching very quickly. Right. 
but the effect is going to be why is this word itself used is because it's something that is inevitable it's something that's approaching so quickly that does not leave the author or the writer or the main character in our passage with any time to prepare so that is the effect that the author is trying to um, imply by using the statement so for effect you talk about how in this case they're talking about summer as something that is unstoppable or something that is coming too fast or something that has given them little or no time to prepare. All right. So all of these statements could be used to describe the effect the author is trying to create. Similarly, if you look at olive trees are prey to flies. Now, in this case, the meaning here is that you simply paraphrase. Uh, when you say that something is a prey to something else, you're saying that it's being attacked, right? So you could talk about how the olive trees are being attacked by flies, how the olive trees are being um, eaten by flies, or how the olive trees are being targeted by the flies. So you simply take that word and you rephrase it for meaning, right? But at the same time, when you're talking about an effect for the word phrase itself, uh, pray itself, the effect is trying to uh, basically imply that this is something inevitable. Yes, it's like their food. The flies are eating it. So what does a prey do to its predator? It eats it, right? The word prey basically means something that has been targeted by something else. A lion preys on, for example, a deer. So in this case, the prey word is trying to imply that the lion is going to eat that deer, right? So in this case, you have to talk about how the meaning implies that the olive trees are being attacked by the flies or eaten by the flies or targeted by the flies or even damaged by the flies. All right. These are literal meanings. But when you look at effect, you have to talk about how it's something that is implying that the olive trees are either defenseless in front of the flies, they need to be protected from the flies, or they're vulnerable in front of the flies. So any word that you can talk about how we're trying to imply a certain meaning by using the word prey. So the idea here is that the author is trying to say that the trees have no um, chance in front of the flies because that's what a prey actually implies. The prey does not have a chance of survival in front of a predator unless it is rescued by someone else. And that analogy is what's being used here. And so you simply highlight the idea that the olive trees were either weak in front of flies or defenseless or vulnerable, all right? And that literally wraps up your 25 marks, all right? So uh, before I wrap this up um just a few pointers that i need to go over in terms of answering your paper two for comprehension since most of you will be attempting this in the morning uh the first thing that i need everyone to keep in mind is that you have to remember to read the questions very very carefully seems like a very redundant statement that every teacher might give you but you need to understand that they're saying this for a reason a lot of times students end up not answering the actual keywords because they don't look at them. So if you think that you are someone who gets confused easily with a lot of information or someone who tends to get lost in a lot of words, the best thing to do would be to read the questions first and then move on to the passage so that you're not overwhelmed by the information that you get. All right. Secondly, you need to keep in mind that if you read the question, circle the keywords if you must. You have a pencil with you, use that to circle keywords. So that when you go back to the passage, you know exactly what to look for. So for example, if the question is asking you uses of nutmeg, so anywhere where they imply, they use the word uses, you know this is related to that question. All right, so that's one thing to look at. Uh, secondly, word limits are important. They're not just written there for um, sake of it. You have to remember that word limits need to be followed with a T. If it says that 170 words, then stick to 170 words. Where they ask you to use your own words, use your own words, but where they aren't asking you to use your own words, they actually expect you to copy and paste. So if you end up writing your own words in a question where they ask you to pick out a phrase, that does not count. Oh, as your, <laughs> that will not count as your response itself. So you have to keep in mind that your answers have to be in terms of the question. If the question says in your own words, you write in your own words, but if it doesn't, you pick out that quote as is and you write it down. Um, a third tip that I would definitely like to share is the idea that 
um, if you have a phrase that you want to quote from the text, you can write in terms of fables. You don't have to think about it in terms of how everything has to be a complete statement. If it says quote a phrase from the text that implies this meaning or pick a uh, phrase that has the opposite meaning for this, in that case, just pick that phrase, write it, and as is, you're good to go. Um, so I think that covers about everything. Do, uh, does anyone have any questions in terms of what we have gone over so far? I'm just going to quickly scroll through the chat um, so that if there are any questions that we left behind. All right, I think we've gone through all of the key points that are mentioned in the chat. So in terms of all of that, we're good to go. Um, any more questions from anyone in particular or are we good to go? Miss, can you explain how to uh, answer the onward question again? Okay, so if you look at um, any question that highlights your own words, you basically have to simplify it in simple English, right? So let me give you an example from the paper that we have just done. All right, so in section two, reading for meaning, the question uh, basically said, just give me a second on screenshot, I'll show you the question. So if you look at this question right here, infected trees could jeopardize our status as olive farmers. All right, this is a question that you're expected to answer in your own words. So what does that mean? You look at the keywords, two words that you have to rephrase, paraphrase basically, the word jeopardize and status. So if you know a synonym for each of them, that's what you write. But in case you do not know a synonym, it's a word that you haven't heard of before. That's when you go back to the passage, look at the passage and in your own words, explain what that phrase itself means. So if you look at the question paper, uh, the insert itself. This line is right here. I stared at the trees in dismay. Right. So he says infected trees could jeopardize our status as olive farmers. So reading this line, can you um, try to understand what the statement means? It's trying to say that something bad will happen. And when they're saying status uh, as olive farmers, their identity as olive farmers, or the fact that they are known as olive farmers and it's going to be jeopardized, that means there's going to be a negative impact to it. So in your own words, you can simply just highlight the idea that um, their reputation as um, olive farmers could be at stake or, or the fact that it could cause damage to their identity as olive farmers. We'll so anything that explains impact. the meaning. Sorry? It will put a bad uh, impact on the status or like that. Uh, bad impact is acceptable, but using the word status again is not acceptable. Okay. So you could say that it could create a bad impact or a negative impact. Now again, bad is not an incorrect word here. Negative is just better, right? So we always have to look for a better word when it comes to memory, look at the better word. Uh, G, so Vaan, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask that if uh, effect is the presence of that particular thing, so uh, we have to write in exam that if we remove the particular thing, what will be effect like this? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Alina, do you have another question? Um, ma'am, can you tell me how much time should I put for like passage one and how much time for passage two? All right, so basically you have one hour, 45 minutes. I would suggest always re leave five minutes in the end to proofread your response. So definitely five minutes for proofreading your summary, right? Now you're left with an hour and 40 minutes. I would suggest 40 minutes are more than enough for your content points and summary. So if you spend 20 minutes highlighting all of your content points, um, take a minute to read through them and then start structuring your summary in 20 minutes. So you at 41 minutes, then you have three to four minutes to just quickly read through your summary. 
and make sure you've included everything and that you haven't missed out on anything. So 45 minutes for that, say about 50 minutes for the next section would still leave you with 10 minutes to, minutes to go over, go over the, remaining the remaining question. Miss? Yes? Miss, the meaning and the effect one is not so clear to me still. So can you please tell more about it? All right, we can go over that. Um, let me look at the question. All right, so basically when we're talking about meaning and effect, meaning means literal meaning. What does it mean in simple words? Effect means what does the author try to create in terms of um, that particular statement itself? So if you look at the first one, galloping pace, the literal meaning of galloping pace means to, um, they're basically trying to imply that you need to imagine a horse running very fast. All right. So the idea here is to talk about that summer was approaching at a galloping pace. And if you don't know what this means, if you look at the um, passage itself, the way they have uh, talked about it in the next statement tells you that this is something that is happening very quickly. So if you look at summer was approaching at a galloping pace, every plant was showing early signs of wilting in the heat. So early signs of wilting in the heat, doesn't this tell you that something is happening before time? So this is how you take out meaning of something that you don't already know the meaning of. If you don't know what galloping pace means, read the next statement because that will always give you a little hint of what the author is trying to imply. Keeping that in mind, we took out the meaning that galloping pace has something to do with something happening very quickly. What is that something? Summer approaching. So for your meaning section, you will simply answer by saying that summer was um, approaching or summer was nearing as a season very, very quickly. All right. It was summertime. And this was before time. So something happening quickly means it's not happening when you expect it to happen. So it's unexpected. Right. So that is where you take out meaning and then talk about the effect that the author is trying to create. Why did the author use the phrase at a galloping pace instead of saying that it was almost summertime. When I say it is almost summertime, and when I say that summer was approaching at a galloping pace, the difference between the effect in both of these statements is the first one is only talking about a simple statement that doesn't cause any concern. But at the same time, if I talk about it approaching at a galloping pace, and I've already implied, like explained that it means something quickly, something happening very, very quickly, then that means. Summer is coming very quickly. Something that comes before time, does that mean you'll be prepared for it? No. That is how your chain of thought is supposed to work in terms of a meaning and effect question. So for meaning, you literally take out the meaning of what it could mean and then talk about how using this particular phrase, what impact did the author create? By saying that it's happening very, very quickly, it's happening at the speed of thunder and lightning. If I replace that and say it's happening at the speed of thunder and lightning, I'm trying to imply that it's happening very quickly. All right. So, excuse me, ma'am. So, yeah. it means, so, excuse me. So, it yeah, means yeah. for meaning, you have to say the uh, the literal meaning of it. Yes. So, the when it says gal meaning, what yes. it means generally. Yes. Okay. Yes. And okay. for effect, you talk about what effect does that phrase. I could, he could have said that summer is approaching very quickly. Right. So, why did the author choose to use this particular phrase to try to imply that if something is literally coming towards you at a very, very fast pace, like a, like a wild horse is coming towards you. Isn't that uh, something um, that you cannot avoid? That's uh, something... for, the, uh, for the effect, then can we uh, take perhaps something from the paragraph itself, like uh, as an evidence to say that this is what the effect could be? I mean, um, a line from there which, showed, um, which would show what the effect of it is? No, you won't do that. You don't need to add in evidence. You just need one statement to okay. talk about what, in your opinion, is the effect. So in this case, all your response would be, uh, in this case, all you'll write is basically, when you're writing, you will say that, um, let me show you the question. And let me show you exactly what you would write. Thank you. Okay, so if this is the question, it says at a galloping pace. So for the first part, what I will do is, I will simply write that, um, Approaching very 
quickly. That's it. That's all, I'm, that's all I'm gonna write. Okay. Okay. So we have to write a phrase for it. We don't yes. write just a word. We yes. have to write a complete sentence. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you just write one statement that highlights what is the meaning. What does it mean that summer was approaching at a galloping pace? It means summer was approaching very, very quickly. Right. Or very fast or very unexpectedly. Right. Can okay. you write the effect, please? Uh, yes, I'm going to write the effect as well. So when we talk about the effect itself, all you have to write over here is going to be, the question itself says, what is the effect? Now, when the author says that it was approaching at a galloping pace, you would say that the arrival of summer was unstoppable. That could be a response. For the effect, we have to refer to the text. Yes. Now, if unstoppable is not a word that you would use in this case, you could replace that with um, something that uh, the arrival of summer was unexpected. All right, something that um, gave the author little or no time to prepare. So the effect basically of anything happening before time, anything happening unexpectedly, what is the effect? If guests show up unexpectedly, what's the first effect that that has on you? The fact that you're unprepared. Isn't that the case? So that is literally how you have to take out meaning and then talk about the effect. What does it literally mean? If it's happening too quickly, it means it's happening too fast, unexpectedly. And at the same time, if it's happening unexpectedly, what effect will that have on me? And in this case, on the author itself. That means he's not prepared. That means it's unstoppable. He can't do anything about it now. That means here we have to infer. Yes. Effect is inferred. Meaning is the explicit That's meaning. Yeah. Effect is the implicit meaning. What you understand happens when something happens too quickly. Right. Right. Let's look right. at the second one as well. When it says olive trees are prey to flies, what does the word prey literally mean? That something is being attacked or something is being eaten or something is being targeted or something is being um, treated as, sorry? Hunted, hunted. Hunted, yeah. So yes, the flies are, we wouldn't say hunted because hunted is a word that we use for, animals. Uh, yes, to animals yeah. in this case, right? So they can attack it Pests do attack plants, but they don't hunt plants. Uh, yeah, so, right? yeah. so it's, it's, it's okay. At least you, your chain of thought went there. right? So you associated that meaning with the word hunted. Now you will say, is this something that I would use for an olive tree? If yes, write it. If no, then think of a better word. All right? So that is what we call a chain of thought. Right, right. All right. So keeping that in mind, the first response would be that olive trees are either attacked by flies, olive trees are eaten by flies, olive trees are targeted by flies. These are your meaning. But at the same time, when we talk about effect, the author is trying to create the effect that the olive trees are weak in front of the flies or can are um, defenseless in front of the flies. So if there are certain um, diseases that attack plants, they can fight them. But if a physical animal is coming to eat that plant, there's not much that that tree can actually do about it, right? So in this case, if flies are coming to eat the olive trees, the olive tree can't do anything about it. It's weak in front of it. And that's the effect that the author was trying to create using the word prey. Right? Um, Alina, do you still have a question? Um, yes. There is this sentence uh, that is, it is harmful for dedicated people who recycle such products. So why is this not an opinion? Uh, in which passage is this? Do you, do you know the paper? Actually, it's my mock paper. And my teacher said that it has a fact in it. But it was like said by the author that I believe 
that it is harmful for dedicated people who recycle such products. It's obviously an opinion, but my teacher said that it's a fact, so it's wrong. So why is it not an opinion? Okay, so I would want more information on that because if your teacher is saying that the word I believe does not imply that it is still an opinion is because of the way the structure of the passage might have gone. Okay. So if the okay, so if the argument is something that is written in a way that highlights the idea that um, was this a passage that talked about um, two sides of an argument? It just talked about how um, fruits are important for our health and okay. we should recycle products so we don't waste food. So the author was saying that I believe that it is harmful for, for, for dedicated people who are like vegetarians uh, to recycle such products. But I don't understand why this is not an opinion. Um, this was not an opinion because uh, they're using a fact and that person is saying that in my opinion, it is seen this way. So the fact was manipulated to fit that person's opinion. Mm. So the fact remained. So they're basically sharing their opinion on the fact. Yes. But I believe okay. that this fact has this impact. Okay. Thank you. One suggestion for such questions would be that if you're confused, read the lines before and after. Because if you read it in a coherent thought, you'll understand exactly the flow of um, information. And that would help you. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Let's give me a minute. I'll open chat. All right. All right. So someone just asked me a question. Uh, if you were asked to write a criticism or warning instead of an opinion for a specific paragraph, how do you identify them? Now, this is where you need to know what a criticism actually is. A criticism is something where the author is trying to talk about an idea as something that the author doesn't agree with, okay? Whereas a warning would be talking about the disadvantages or um, a negative impact that that thing could have, okay? So as long as you understand what that word means, the way it's structured should help you talk about how either the person is expressing their own opinion, that would be a criticism, a negative opinion. But at the same time, it is, if it's something that's highlighting that this is a disadvantage, so beware, that is a warning. All right. All right, so there are a lot of responses that are not allowed, which are most of the time answered by students. Okay, so um, this is where keywords comes in. So if you think you're confused about the information you're choosing to add as your response, just look at the keywords of the question, okay? Um, okay, someone just asked me if a question is a literature effect. Now, the questions that we actually looked at right now, those were literary effects. The word uh, gallop, the phrase galloping pace, it's a literary device that the author used. So if they're talking about what literary effect that created, you could talk about how the author is trying to create an image in your mind of something that's approaching very, very quickly, like a horse would. Okay, that's what a literary effect is. Um, all right, uh, literary effects, criticism answered. Um, I believe that's about it. Um, just keep in mind, you are not expected to add in evidence for the effect because the statement they've given you that itself is the evidence. So you don't need to add in any evidence for an effect question. You simply have to simplify it in terms of what you think the um, idea is. All right. So you don't have to write um, any evidence for this. The evidence they've given you, they're asking you, what does this evidence mean? What effect is this evidence trying to portray? Um, that seems to be about it. Any more questions? 
again, half of these questions can be answered by saying, read the question carefully, highlight keywords. All right, I believe that's about it. Uh, no paragraphs in summary. So if you write in one uh, paragraph, that's fine. Um, until and unless it's a summary that highlights two ideas, two distinct ideas. So for example, the passage they've given you is something that talks about advantages and disadvantages of something. And that's what they want you to summarize. Usually they'll either ask you to summarize one aspect. And if they're asking you to summarize both aspects, that's where you can actually have two paragraphs. All right. No, you cannot write below the points of uh, lines of the content points. Try to avoid overwriting. So try not to write in the margins. Try to stick to your lines. Okay. So the best way to do that is again, read the paragraph carefully, look at the content points and highlight them and number them. Actually, I would say when you're highlighting them, just underline and write number one, number two, number three, number four. That will know exactly how many you have. Uh, no, you're not allowed to use additional sheets. Um, yes, you can put two to three content points in one to two lines. That's fine. As long as you coherently create a sentence for that, uh, you, it's better to write the points in order. Now, the reason for that is, although the notes are not supposed to be in a particular sequence and that's not what they're testing, but when you have to write that response in your um, summary itself, that's when you have to keep in mind that the response has to be in order because if it's not in an order, it's actually going to um, be very confusing for you because if you start writing your content points in a confused manner, you'll actually end up making a mistake in your actual summary. So no, do not mess up the order. Um, yes, you can skip points if you think absolutely necessary, but I would suggest instead of skipping points uh, when writing your summary, Join two to three together if you think there are too many. Uh, no examples in the summary unless it's actually needed. So if they're talking about uses and they're talking about, for example, we have sweets and desserts. Ki baat ki, giving one example there could work, but that again is if you think you can fit it all in within the same word limit. Um, should we rephrase the notes to help the passage? Yes, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to rephrase the notes in order to write the summary itself. Uh, do you have any more questions? Okay, so for the opinion and uh, meaning questions, the best trick that I can tell you is that meaning is explicit meaning. So you read the content and in your own words, jo aapko samaj aari about what it's talking about, that's the question. The, what is the author talking about? Right? If you write that in your own words, you're answering the meaning question. However, in terms of your opinion questions, it has to be something that is not exactly mentioned within the passage, but it's an understanding of what is going on in the passage itself. So opinion is mostly implied. So it's not outright mentioned. You have to take out the meaning from the words given. Um, if you don't know the meaning of a word and you have to write it in your own words, the best way would be to simplify the overall context. Yes, transitional words are very important in the summary because if you don't use them, then your um, statements will be very um, bland. They will not have proper sentence structure. It would literally mean as if you have written all of your content points one after the other. Transition points actually brings a flow in your writing. And it is going to help you actually um, create compound sentences when you use transition words. Um, could you please repeat again regarding opinions and uh, the meaning? All right, so um, you're talking about how, what's the difference between your opinion and the intended meaning? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah, regarding the passage one, yeah. Okay, so in passage one, if you're asked to highlight what a certain phrase means, right? It simply has to simplify what the author is trying to say. For example, when we had that statement where we talked about how Rene had an edge of, uh, an edge in his voice. 
So the author is trying to imply that or is trying to just say that it means he had a certain negative emotion associated with his, with his voice, right? But then at the same time, a question that we had for the same passage was when the author talks about something being um, said in comprehensively. Let me just pick out the passage it said. Um, it says that he muttered incomprehensible misgivings. Now, in this case, if you're talking about opinion, in your opinion, what do you think this is trying to portray? The question, if phrased like that, you will highlight that it's trying to portray that although Rene had shown um, a certain disbelief in the beginning, later on when, he, when Rene realized that this is not something I should have said, just mumbled away and walked away to, you know, kill the conversation. Now, if it's something that's implied, not said outright, but it's something that you understand. That is your opinion. In your opinion, what do you think this phrase meant? Personal view? Yeah, uh, but personal view in terms of context. Yeah, of the passage related. Yes. So it has to always be in reference to the context. So over here, nothing is your personal opinion. It is your understanding of the passage. Right. Okay. Right. So when it says opinion, the reason why the word opinion is used is because the, the examiner is trying to imply that every student will have a different opinion in terms of the word to use mm -hmm. to highlight this idea. Right. That's what it means. Not right. that you will have a completely different um, aspect altogether. That's not what it means. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so someone just asked me if transitional words and connectives are the same. Um, they're not exactly the same when we're talking about. Um, uh, yes, they do have a specimen paper, but at this point, um, I would actually like to give you a suggestion. If you are up for more revision right now, I would actually suggest you look at the website, the O-level website, where they actually have a comparison of student responses with the examiner responses. Uh, so remember, there's a file that I have if we could share with the students. Is that an option? It's basically called the example candidate responses for paper two. So if you type that up for uh, double one, two, three, this will actually take you to the website and they have sample responses by the examiners themselves. So if you read through that, I think that would help you. It's the CIE website. So you just type in CIE 1123 and write down um, example responses. Uh, could you please say that again? For paper two. So it's could 1123 example uh, candidate responses. Uh, Ma'am, could you give the website again, please? Yeah, I'm just going to pull up the link and I'll share it with you. I'm just going to share the link with you in the chat. All right, so if you could just head over to the chat, I have pasted the link there. Um, this should be for everyone. Right. So if you go over this uh, link, this is um, candidate responses with examiner um, comments. So this is a good resource. If you want to just look through um, how responses are rated by the examiner. So it just look through a few of them and that should really help you in terms of the overall um, comparison of what good vocabulary is, of what medium level vocabulary is considered, and then we have a low response that's going to be very low bandwidth. Okay, so I think this is something that's going to answer most of your questions anyways. So do look at this. It's a very short read. So if you go through this, they've answered a whole. Um... All right. So uh, when I talk about transitional words, we are actually talking about words like, however, moreover, initially, furthermore, words that we transition between two statements. However, if I talk about a connective, that's going to be um, and 
but. So when we are trying to connect two statements together, that's when we use a connected or a connector, all right? Mm, any more questions? Yeah, firstly, secondly, thirdly, for points, if you're talking about different uh, points, and that's, that, those are the transition words you would use. So do we have any more questions? All right, I guess not. Um, good luck, everyone. Again, please read through the paper very, very, very carefully. Look at the keywords, highlight the keywords, read the questions first, and then look at the passage. And now, yes, you can um, all go practice. Please go over the link that I shared. Trust me, it will help. Look at the responses and the examiner comments. All right, you're all good to go. Um, I hope this was helpful. And um, just make sure you read the question very, very carefully. All right, thank you so much for being here, everyone.